Hello, coders. So where we finished off last week, things may have not looked quite right. The floor object is appearing much too dark. Based on where our point light and vase objects are, we would expect the light source to be directly above some point in this region here. The diffuse model tells us that when the surface normal and direction to the light source are parallel to each other, the light should be at its brightest, since the cosine of zero degrees is a maximum. But right now we are only calculating the light intensity at each vertex. And then we use fragment interpolation for the color across the face of the triangle. That's why the floor looks so dark. The lighting model is only being applied correctly at each corner of the floor. And then we are simply blending between each corner's color value. The reason the vase models look mostly correct is that they have a high vertex count. So a possible solution would be to increase the vertex count for the floor object. But even on the vase objects, if you zoom in, you can start to see where vertex-based lighting doesn't do a great job, particularly around areas of high contrast. In the early days of 3D graphics, when processing was very limited, vertex-based lighting was the preferred method. But nowadays, any graphics device can easily calculate lighting per fragment. This is known as per-fragment lighting. Rather than interpolating the final color value, we can instead interpolate the surface normal at each vertex. Then within the fragment shader, we use the interpolated normal vector and the direction to the light source from the position of the fragment to calculate the intensity of light at each fragment value. So let's get started. First, in the app implementation, we specify in the global set layout to provide the global UBO object only to the vertex shader. Since we will now want access to the point light fields in the fragment shader, we can either add the fragment bit to this line here, or alternatively, set binding zero to be available to all graphics stages using the all graphics flag. Then, in the vertex shader, copy your global UBO uniform definition, navigate to the fragment shader and paste the UBO definition into the file. Next, back in the vertex shader, we need to add two more output fields. The first field at location 1 will be the vertex's world position. This value will be linearly interpolated to be the fragment's position in world space on the fragment shader. We need this to calculate the direction to the light source for each fragment. The field at location 2 will hold the fragment normal in world space, which will also be interpolated for the fragment shader. We need to initialize these variables inside the main function. The frag normal world field can replace the normal world space variable. The fragment position world is simply the x, y, and z components of the position world variable. And finally, the frag color value is now just equal to the vertices color. The remaining code is all for calculating the light's intensity. So let's copy and remove it from the vertex shader and paste it into the fragment shader's main function. Before we fix up this code here, we should update the fragment inputs. So we have at location one, the input for our frag position world, and location two is the frag normal world. Okay, now our direction to light calculation is mostly correct. I just need to change from the position world variable to the fragment position world. Attenuation looks good, and light color and ambient light both look good. The diffuse light color should use the fragment normal value, and now an easy mistake to make is to forget to normalize your normal vectors on the fragment shader. Even though each normal has already been normalized in the vertex shader, the linear interpolation of two normal vectors isn't necessarily normal itself. So we need to again normalize the fragment's normal before using it within any calculations. And finally, the output color will use the same calculation, multiplying the sum of the light's intensity by the fragment's color value and keep the alpha component's value at one. Build and run your code, making sure to recompile your shaders. And now the floor object is looking significantly better. You can see that the location on the floor directly below the light source is now the brightest area. Additionally, if we zoom in on the smooth vase object, you can see the interpolation artifacts from before have now disappeared. Okay, now, before wrapping this tutorial up, I'd like to slightly improve how we are currently storing the game objects in the engine. Rather than use a vector, let's change the game objects to use an unordered map. In the game objects header, add a type alias where the map's key will be the game object ID. This way, game objects can be efficiently looked up in constant time using their ID.
As mentioned before, this is still not a great solution for entity component systems, but this will keep things flexible until we do eventually get to implementing a more efficient system with all the properties we desire. And don't forget to include unordered map here. And then in the frame info, we can include the game object's header and add a game object map reference to the struct. This way, any system we make will have access to all active game objects without the need to always pass in extra parameters. Then update the first app header to instead now store a map of game objects. And then let's fix up the implementation. So we construct the frame info with the game objects map, and we can remove the game objects argument from the render system function call since the system can now access it through the frame info struct. Now, just below in the load game objects function, instead of using the pushback operator, which works for vectors, we can now use the in place operator to move the game object into the map. In addition to the object itself, we need to specify each game object's key, which is accessible using the get ID getter as the first argument to the in place function. So this has the effect of creating a map of game objects which can be iterated through like before, but now has the additional feature that if we know a game object's ID, we can use it to directly access the object being stored. This means we can now easily create relationships between game objects simply by storing another game object's ID, which will act sort of like a pointer to the object. The final thing to fix up is the simple render system. In its header, remove the extra parameter for the game objects that we no longer need. Note that if we want to target specific game objects, we could instead pass in a vector of game object IDs and then use those IDs to index into the game object map. In the render systems implementation, we fix up the function definition to match. And now iterating through all game objects in the code is slightly different. When iterating through a map, each instance we get is a key value pair. So to access the game object, we create a reference equal to kv.second. Okay, so with this change, now every system will be provided with all the same game objects. We need to add some way for a system to determine which objects it actually wants to use. And there are a couple ways to do this. First, as previously mentioned, we can provide a vector of game object IDs, which specifies exactly what game objects to act upon. The disadvantage of this approach is that you are responsible for writing additional code to manage the IDs vector. The second approach, which is more in the spirit of an entity component system, is to have the system itself decide which objects it wants to use. An easy way for us to do that right now is to add some filtering criteria onto each system that will ignore game objects that don't meet the specified requirements. So for example, the simple render system can skip over any game object that does not have an associated model object. The main disadvantage with the second approach is that this means each system must filter through every game object which can be quite inefficient as your scenes become more complex. However, with a better designed entity component system, albeit a bit more complicated, this performance disadvantage can be mitigated. Anyway, that's really it for this one. Build and run your code to make sure everything is still working as before. And thank you for watching. Keep on coding. Cheers.